Professor of International uh, Management. He's also the Associate Dean in charge of Global Partnership Programs at MIT Sloan School of uh, Management. And at MIT, he's also the Faculty Director of um, Action Learning uh, and the Founder and Director of the China India Lab, which provides low cost consulting services to small and medium size uh, enterprises in China and India. Um, Professor Huang has uh, written widely on um, uh, Chinese um, political economy um, and is the author of um, Capitalism, a, a, a number of books, but um, uh, notably Capitalism with Chinese Characteristics uh, that came out with Cambridge in uh, 2008 and um, Selling China, Foreign Direct Investment. Uh, during the reform period, also with Cambridge, that was in 2002. Uh, he's changed presses. Um, his his new book is coming out with, um, with Yale University uh, Press in, um, in August, and it is titled The Rise and Fall of the EAST, How Exams, Autocracy, Stability, and Technology Brought Success and Why They Might Lead uh, to brought China success and why they might lead to its decline. Um, a few words just about the format. So we're hybrid um, and um, tonight. Um, so um, following uh, Yashang's um, lecture, we'll, we'll open things up uh, both to uh, online and in, in the um, theater here, give you an opportunity to uh, put questions. Um, to him. Uh, for those of you who are online, you just need to submit your questions via the Q&A function um, at the bottom of your screen. Please make sure to include your name and affiliation. We like to belt those out. Um, and for those of you in the theater, I'll let you know when the floor is open. And then if you just put your hands up, I'll identify you and then the ushers will come with, um, with a microphone. Um, and uh, if you haven't already, just please um, put your phones on silent since this will be recorded um, and, and posted. Um, and, um, and with that, uh, please join me in giving Professor Huang a warm uh, LSE welcome. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for the introduction. It is my great pleasure and honor to um, make a presentation at uh, LSE and to share uh, with you some findings from my forthcoming book. Uh, the book is all done, is in the process of being printed, and it's going to come out in August uh, this year. Um, and Peter and I were talking about uh, one effect of a pandemic. And the effect that's relevant here is that apparently they ran out of paper. Uh, so there's a, there's a delay in publication. So relative to that delay, I'm very eager to make the presentation. So I'm going to make the presentation a few months before the book uh, comes out. And the, so the cover is done and it's already on the Amazon. And the East, uh, it is not geographic East. It is uh, about exams uh, 
uh, autocracy and stability and technology in that order. And the book alternates between history and today's China. So it is not a historical book, neither it is completely about contemporary China. What I try to do in the book is to draw lessons from history and to think forward and also to analyze what has happened in China today. And I do believe that for any society and China being um, one civilization that has a level of continuity that is quite remarkable, history matters um, and history shapes contemporary developments. And importantly in my book, I argue that history shapes the way that we think about the world, right? Uh, because history affects our norms and happen, uh, affects uh, our mental model. And so in my book, I try to unpack that uh, uh, men mental model. But today I'm not going to talk about the whole book because after all, I want you to go and, go and buy it. Uh, I'm just going to, um, focus on two letters uh, of the four, and one is on autocracy and the other is on, on technology. And if you sort of link these two letters together, there's a deep a puzzle, right? The puzzle is that um, how has the Chinese Communist Party, um, the world's foremost autocracy, um, it has the, the size of the Chinese Communist Party is uh, 96 million people, right? If you rank Chinese Communist Party along the countries in the world, it is the 11th largest uh, organization in the world, right? So this is an incredible organization, but it is an incredible autocracy as well. How does a autocracy achieve the level of success in science and technology the way that CCP has? Because the conventional wisdom, and you probably get some exposure to that conventional wisdom by taking econ classes and management classes at LSE, the conventional wisdom is that freedom is critical to creative energy and autonomy, academic autonomy, academic freedom is important for innovations. Yet this is a country that is um, extremely autocratic and yet it has also achieved uh, a level of uh, scientific and technological success. So I'm gonna draw experiences and lessons from history to try to answer that deep puzzle. And then I'm gonna end on drawing some policy implications for the US, right? I live in the United States, so I'm more familiar with the US I'll mostly talk about the US rather than UK and Europe, but I think there are some commonalities uh, between these countries in terms of how they think about China. So let's talk about history. Um, so as you know that there's an American century, there's um, um, uh, Britannica, um, hegemony of, uh, of uh, Britannica. Long before that, there was a multiplicity of Chinese century, right? China dominated the rest of the world in terms of technological leadership many centuries before America did that, many centuries before Britain did that, right? China led Europe in iron casting by 1500 years, right? And so these are centuries, these are not decades and years. Uh, China was significantly ahead of Europe in ship construction, maneuverability and navigation techniques, agriculture, industrial technologies, such as uh, hydraulic uh, engineering, cultivation, irrigation, textile spinning, porcelain making, among numerous other technologies. China was way ahead of Europe by many, many centuries. China famously invented the big four, right? paper, the compass, gunpowder, printing, uh, water clock, uh, also water clock. Right? Its hydraulic uh, spinning machine in 13th century 
was uh, on the par with similar machines in Europe in, in uh, 18th century, right? So, so this is a, a, a artistic reconstruction of two very famous voyages, right? On the uh, left, it is uh, seven voyages by uh, Zheng He. Right? And on your right, it is the voyage from Europe to uh, America by Christopher Columbus, right? Zheng He's voyages had 10,000 ships, right? uh, tens of thousands of sailors. Uh, Christopher Columbus' um, voyage had seven ships. And in terms of the complexity of technology, there's just no comparison between these two voyages. And scholars have cataloged Chinese inventions, and this is from a book. How do I make the, the, the top control panel disappear? Is there a way to, because um, it's blocking uh, some information, yeah. Maybe it should be blocked. Um, the, no. if, if you look at... You mean where it says recording and sharing. Okay, so maybe I couldn't do it, yeah. Um, so if you look at the this table, uh, it lists 100 inventions. Uh, it is a very impressive list, way ahead of Europe. I thought only at MIT we struggle with technology. <laughs> yeah. um, but there are some, you know, the big four, as I pointed out, compass, gunpowder. But there are other inventions that came from China that at least were, su were a surprise to me. App apparently brandy was invented in, uh, in, in China. Umbrella was invented uh, by Chinese. Uh, toilet paper was invented by Chinese, right? So, so Chinese, when we usually we we associate Chinese inventiveness with the four big four inventions. In fact, that actually underestimates the Chinese inventiveness because Chinese invented lots of other things. But what happened to this initial and substantial lead in Chinese uh, technology? Chinese technology stagnated and then completely collapsed. So there's debate about timing of that. Um, one of the things that we have done is we created a database on Chinese inventions and our finding is that Chinese inventions, Chinese technology began to decline much earlier than what is commonly believed among historians, which is 17th century, 18th century. Uh, we are able to show that Chinese uh, technology began to decline as early as 6th century, right? Industrial revolution, uh, never happened in China. It happened right here in England. Right? So essentially you had this kind of inventive um, uh, achievements without producing economic growth. Right? So we usually typically think about technology as an input to economic growth and Chinese producer technologies, but none of that delivered uh, economic growth on the scale of industrial revolution. It, it delivers some growth, but it didn't deliver, you know, quadrupling of the GDP. It didn't deliver the discovery of new drugs and uh, the, 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 the scientific revolution. By 19th century, China was one of the poorest countries in the world, right? And it suffered a, what is known as a century of uh, humiliation, right? The Opium War, the defeat by Japan in 1895, right? So any student who, uh, who, who has studied Chinese history would know what I'm talking about. 
So I offered an explanation for both why China was able to initially lead the rest of the world and then why its leadership completely collapsed in my, in my book. So technological development, both in history and in today, I argue, depends on getting two things right. right? For uh, simplicity, I call these two things a scale and scope. What is a scale? Scale means a financial and human capital commitment, right? To do science requires a lot of scientists, a lot of research assistants, and also science and technology are extraordinarily expensive. So it requires a substantial capital investment. It requires government support, right? Or private sector support. And also it requires applications. So one way to think about the industrial revolution is that basically industrial revolution is an application of technologies, right? So to translate technologies into economic growth and economic growth is the applied result of technologies. And the other is scope. Scope means a creative space for technologists and for inventors. And roughly speaking, scope translates in my book to academic freedom, democracy, right? And other people may add other elements to that, such as uh, rule of law, uh, property rights protection. But let me stay away from these institutional requirements and focus on the immediate operating environment of science and technology, right? So we have assembled data to indicate Again, you're looking at the historical data. Looking at historical Chinese technology. And this is a simple graph. And let me just say what that graph is. The blue line represents the share of technologists in, employed by the government, right? And on the horizontal axis, it is uh, different Chinese dynasties moving from early on the left to later dynasties on your right. right? On the vertical axis, it is the uh, shear of, of uh, technologists, and also the red line represents humanists uh, employed by the government. Right? So what that graph shows, it's a very simple graph, but what that graph shows is that imperial governments in China employed a very high proportion of technologists and humanists, right? So in modern times, we think about government support for science and technology in the form of R&D spending, right? Expenditure on science, expenditure on technology. In the ancient times, the government didn't do that, right? But by employing so many of these technologies, they provided financial and economic security for the inventors. So then they could uh, do the thinking, they could do the uh, inventions. Right? Otherwise, these people had to go and plant rice in the fields. Right? So this is the way that I theorize about the government support indirectly, not direct government support, not intentional to support technology, but nevertheless, it had the effect of liberating these creative individuals from doing manual labor, from doing physical labor, right? So then they had more time and leisure to focus on creative activities. So that is incredibly high ratio. In the West, I don't think, even though I don't have the data, I don't think we can find anything even remotely close to that level of government support, in part because in the West, bureaucracy was very small in the first place, right? In China, bureaucracy uh, was massive in size, right? Uh, so in the West, the typical support for creative individuals came from private 
individuals, right? Uh, da Vinci, you know, he was supported by Medici family, right? So it was a private support, but the private support, first of all, the scale is much smaller. And also it happened much later than the Chinese government support in this particular form, right? So we're talking about at the beginning of a Chinese dynasty, we're talking about 200 BCE, right? You know, third century before, uh, before Common Era, uh, the Chinese government already supported something like 60 to 65% of the technologists, right? This is just a remarkable level of government support. So part of the reason why Chinese succeeded is because of that, right? government support. As you can see, the government support, even though it declined a little bit toward the end of the Chinese uh, dynasty, uh, dynastic uh, history, it still remained at relatively high level. We're talking about fluctuation between sort of 75% to 55%, right? It declined by 20 percentage points, but still, you know, 55% is still pretty substantial. So the scale remained more or less constant. What happened was the scope collapsed. Political freedom, ideological freedom completely disappeared in China. So China was fragmented between 220 to 580, right? And that was an era, uh, one era, uh, one period from that era is very famous. Uh, it is known, it is uh, described in a novel called The Three, um, The Romance of the Three Kingdoms. For people, for many people sitting in the audience, uh, you probably didn't read the book, but you might have played a computer game uh, on the romance of the three kingdoms. So, so that was a very famous, so that era, very interestingly, is known mostly for that novel. And what we have found is that that era is incredibly creative, incredibly energetic, incredibly inventive, right? That was the freest era in Chinese history. So I argue in my book, China reached a European condition between Europe, Europe did, right? So essentially Europe today is a divided continent, separate and, and Britain made it more divided by uh, Brexit. Um, that's another topic uh, altogether. And uh, so the reason why Europe uh, sort of um, collapsed into these different kingdoms is because Western Roman Empire collapsed in 476. But China entered into this degree of fragmentation in 220, right, ahead of Europe into that stage and state of fragmentation. And, that, and China was in that situation for 360 years. But a very famous dynasty, Sui Dynasty, reunified China in 580. It is not just through the military conquest that Sui unified China. And this is the E part of my book, exam part of my title. Sui invented the civil service exam system that kept China unified from that point on, right? So basically from one, uh, 580, uh, China more or less has remained a unified political entity much because of that invention. Yes, there were periods when China went into a divided uh, situation, but those uh, periods were very short in duration. Right? Um, and China today is a unified uh, uh, political entity. Right? So by 580, Right. 
multiple governments in China before that collapse into one. Essentially, if you look at statistics, before 580, if you take the ratio of a divided political system to unified political system, the ratio is about 0.7. After the Sui Dynasty, the ratio is 0.3. It flipped. It flipped. So essentially, from 580, China has remained a unified political system, with 30% of the time kind of being divided. Um, and then there was a collapse of ideology. Confucianism gained absolute dominance during the Song Dynasty, right? So about 10th century. Buddhism collapsed as a competitor to Confucianism. Taoism began to decline in 13th century. So Buddhism declined first around 10th century, and then Taoism followed in 13th century. So basically, after 13th century, China had one ideology left, and that was Confucianism. There was no other single idea that could compete with Confucianism on the scale of uh, Confucianism. So we make these claims based on data, right? So I'm not a historian, um, and I have to be humbled by, by that fact. Um, so we use data, we have uh, uh, assembled uh, data on government support. I already show you the proportion of technologists employed by the government. We also assembled uh, ideological data, looking at the shares of different ideologies through different periods of time. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit about technology data, the, the data on technology. So, we used two source materials. One is by Joseph Needham, Science and Civilization of China. For those of you who don't know Joseph Needham is, uh, he was a British uh, academic uh, professor of, uh, in fact, biology at uh, Cambridge University. He became interested in China in the 1930s. And he and his students compiled 27 volumes on Chinese inventions and technology. So that's one of our source materials. And the other source material is by Chinese Academy of Sciences, the history of Chinese science and technology. So this is a massive uh, work to uh, transfer text data into basically Excel. Uh, Excel sheet, right? And without the help from chat GPT uh, at that time. So it was a collaboration uh, project with Tsinghua University. And uh, at one point we had 44 researchers working on this project at Tsinghua University. And then we had uh, 10 um, uh, researchers at MIT who coded uh, the data match and assign the data to different dynasties um, of China. So I like to tell you, you know, it is because of MIT technology, but most of it is just money work, uh, sheer, sheer money work. It took six years to do this. Right? The current run is we have about 10,350 inventions. We have about 15, uh, thousand, but then a lot of them we cannot match with a time period. So essentially we cannot really use them. Let me just tell you, you know, first of all, I feel very accomplished doing this, uh, but let me just tell you how accomplished I should feel about this. Uh, until this data set, the largest database on Chinese technology has about 600 inventions, right? We have 10,000. Um, so there's just no, no comparison. And there has not been any similar database on Europe uh, of, of this kind of scale. Uh, so ours is the world's first 
large scale systematic database on a country's uh, technological development. So let me show you the data. Um, and I divide Chinese history into kind of a three periods, uh, going from kind of fourth century BCE to about sixth century CE as the first period. The second period from roughly sixth century CE, uh, the, the middle one, to 13th century CE. And then the last period from 13th century CE to uh, 20th century. So, as you can see, there's a dra dramatic drop uh, between the first period and the second period. And then there's uh, another drop from the second period to the third period. So previously, most of the um, most of the uh, historians believe that Chinese technology began to decline somewhere here, right? Um, if you can follow the red dot, somewhere here, uh, or even er uh, later, right? Whereas ours showed that the decline happened much earlier. And that pattern matches with the political development uh, and the data we have assembled on political developments and ideological developments. As I said before, in the first period, China became from a kind of divided, multiple federation of kingdoms to one single empire, right? So essentially political diversity disappeared by sixth century. And then you'll see this drop. And then you began to see the decline of ideology in the 10th century and then in the 13th century. And then that was associated with another drop, right? So essentially the idea here is that the political and ideological diversity, freedom of speech, if you want to use a modern expression, um, was very important during the first period of Chinese history. There are some nuances. I'll, I'll be happy to answer questions about that period uh, because during that period, China was also unified for 400 years. Um, I'll come back during the Q&A if there's an interest. Um, so, so this pattern follows fairly closely with what we know about what happened in Europe, right? In Europe, the inventions and technologies develop when Europe became fragmented politically and ideologically. And China did exactly the same thing in the reverse order. China was first fragmented and then it first began to develop technology and then became a unified empire and became a unified uh, ideological uh, um, um, uh, period. And then it went into uh, technological stagnation. Um, the other related thing is, um, so, so what this graph shows is that empires are not very good at inventions. Uh, so on the uh, horizontal axis, it is the size of the Chinese dynasties, right? Uh, on the vertical axis, it is how inventive a dynasty is, right? So if you go, uh, the higher they are, the more uh, inventive they are, the more to your right, the larger they are, right? So the larger empires, tend to score low on the inventiveness index, right? And the inventive ones tend to score low on the size index. Right? So there's a direct inverse correlation between the two. The red line represents uh, the share of the Buddhists among prominent historical figures of China. We have a database on 10,000 prominent historical figures, um, personalities, and we quote their belief by Buddhism, by Taoism. Um, 
So what this shows is that Buddhism re reached its peak roughly during the Tang Dynasty, and then it collapsed during the Song Dynasty, right? And it was low here before, that's because Buddhism was imported um, from India in the first century CE. So, so the Buddhism, so the fact that Buddhism is low here doesn't mean that Chinese ideology was uh, monopolistic. It's just that it didn't have Buddhism because it was imported later. If you look at Taoism, which is also a native religion in China, uh, which was a native religion in China. So it is a better representation of ideological space of China. Taoism was, was, was quite substantial. And then it took a deep uh, a dive during the 13th century after, uh, during the Ming Dynasty. Um, so essentially, just to repeat, you have the collapse of political scope, and then sequentially you have first the collapse of Buddhism, and then you have the collapse of Taoism as competitors to uh, Confucianism. Okay, so this is a long introduction to uh, China today. Uh, so I have one chapter on history, one chapter on China today. If there's a way to describe the belief of the Chinese Communist Party about technology, then that would be that they believe in scale. Right? They believe in government support, they believe in spending money, they believe in spending a lot of people on science and technology. They are not too keen on scope, okay? So if you look at what the Chinese Communist Party has done, they have supported science and technology on a massive scale. Chinese uh, R&D spending is among the highest in the world and definitely highest at the Chinese per capita GDP level. But they don't believe that scope is necessary, right? They typically uh, criticize uh, political and academic freedom as Western ideology, right? Democracy is viewed as a hindrance to doing big projects because democracy weakens the government support. You have to divide the resources and you have to uh, sort of uh, entertain differences of uh, opinions. They believe all of that is, is noise and nuisance. Uh, in terms of technological development. You know, Made in China uh, 2025 is a very impressive industrial policy program concentrating just on a few sectors of the economy. Massive support for semiconductor, right? Now the support has increased even more because the United States is trying to isolate China from the, from the semiconductor supply chain, global supply chain. At the same time, when they step up support for science and technology, they have curtailed scope conditions. They have cracked down on the private sector, right? Um, I just learned that Jack Ma returned to China, but I don't know for sure. Um, and they cracked down on Hong Kong, right? Uh, essentially one country, two system now becomes in effect one country, one system. Uh, under Xi Jinping, there has been a very antagonistic relationship between China and, uh, and the West. Right. You know, between China and Europe, it's okay, but between US and China, it's really bad. Um, China now, in the last 40 years, is at its most autocratic moment. Right? So on the Left side is comparing internet freedom between China and Taiwan, right? The right one is China at a, at a, at a very low level and Taiwan is at a relatively high level. And then there's a measure of uh, Hong Kong's uh, freedom uh, index, right? It has declined sharply in the recent years. Essentially the 
right? So it's, it's kind of a scope conditions in historical terms going back to the sixth century, okay? But in terms of scale, right, you, you have to acknowledge that China has a huge scale advantage in terms of annual growth of the GDP. It has grown uh, most fast among a uh, number of countries. And on the right side, it is uh, about the GDP support relative to what you expect the country to be in terms, of, in terms of its per capita GDP, right? So basically what that graph says is that relative to China's per capita GDP, China is spending way more money on, on, on R&D as compared with countries in a similar, uh, in a similar income group. But China has, as I pointed out before, curtailed the scope conditions. So, so if you believe that technology is a function of both scale and scope, now they only have the scale left without the scope conditions. Let me use Hong Kong to illustrate the importance of scope conditions for China, right? So again, so my, this part of my lecture is about China today, but it is also true between 1978 and 2018, I define Chinese reform era as from 1978 to 2018. 2018, in my view, is the end of the Chinese reform era, right? So between, 1970, uh, between 1978 and 2018, China did achieve quite impressive progress on science and technology and also on high-tech entrepreneurship. The argument that I laid out in my book is that China at that time had both scale and scope, right? Let me use Hong Kong as an illustration of the scope condition China had. And then undermining Hong Kong essentially is impairing that one scope condition that China had that enabled Chinese technological and entrepreneurial takeoff. So under one country, two systems, before the 2019 national security law, China had, uh, Hong Kong had rule of law, China had efficient finance, China had active finance, financial and political press. It is true that China, uh, sorry, Hong Kong didn't have direct democracy, but it had civil rights, it had uh, 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 um, freedom of press, it had rule of law. Those conditions turned out to be vital for China's high-tech entrepreneurship. Okay. So this is the way I interpret Hong Kong and its importance to Chinese high-tech entrepreneurs. Right. The CCP system itself didn't have and definitely doesn't have those conditions. Uh, efficient finance, rule of law, and, lip, uh, and free press. But the CCP in the past allowed the Chinese high-tech entrepreneurs to access conditions in Hong Kong. Right? It turns out many, many high-tech entrepreneurial companies were registered in Hong Kong to access rule of law, to access uh, the financial uh, support in Hong Kong in a way that they cannot within China itself, right? So, mm -hmm. so this is the scope conditions I'm describing in my book. Yes, in the past, before Xi Jinping, the CCP didn't you know, develop rule of law, didn't develop democracy, didn't develop uh, liberal and free press, but it allowed entrepreneurs to access those conditions outside of China, in Hong Kong. So in 2019, MIT Technology Review had a special issue on China. So that special issue listed number of uh, Chinese high-tech entrepreneurs and high-tech uh, enterprises in internet, in facial recognition, in biotechnology. 
If you look at the examples provided by the MIT Technology Review in that year, many of these companies were registered in Hong Kong. Right? Almost two thirds of them were registered in Hong Kong. And I have looked at the biotech firms um, like Beijing, Wuxi App, and Xyla, many of these biotech firms that are now producing majority of Chinese patents in biotechnology, each single one of them is registered in Hong Kong. So Hong Kong is quite important as a safe harbor to these high-tech uh, entrepreneurs and to these high-tech uh, companies as a place of financing, as a place of rule of law. Why does that matter? It matters for policy. There's an article in 2019 by a Cornell University economist in the New York Times with the title, Why China No Longer Needs Hong Kong. It laid out the economic argument, right? In 1997, when China returned to Hong Kong, uh, uh, Hong Kong, oh, sorry, I said it exactly the opposite. Um, when Hong Kong returned to China, 50% um, of the trade went through Hong Kong, and Hong Kong's uh, GDP was about one fifth of uh, Chinese uh, GDP. But today, only 12% of the trade went to Hong Kong, and Hong Kong's GDP is only one thirtieth of Chinese GDP. So he argues in the article, China doesn't really need Hong Kong. Hong Kong as an economic entity is not that important. That is absolutely a wrong view of looking at Hong Kong, right? Based on the trade GDP metrics, right? This scholar and possibly Chinese leaders think that sort of demolishing freedom and autonomy of Hong Kong does not have any economic consequences because it's, you know, GDP is small. The trade intermediation role is very small. So there's no economic price to pay by, uh, by going after the autonomy of Hong Kong. But I would argue, I beg to differ. I would argue that uh, Hong Kong practically owns China's high-tech space. Now you demolish Hong Kong, Singapore has emerged to be a substitute place for Hong Kong, right? I don't believe Hong, uh, Singapore can do that effectively as Hong Kong did, uh, but nevertheless, a lot of Chinese entrepreneurs are now going to Singapore. But it is very important to point this thing out. Rather than simply looking at trade and GDP data, we need to look at the legal and the financial functions of Hong Kong to understand why Hong Kong's autonomy, why Hong Kong's uh, independence are very important for Chinese uh, uh, entrepreneurs. Also, without the press freedom uh, accountability, a lot of the scale advantage that China has is actually wasted. Right? Let me give you the example of a semiconductor. The industrial policy initiatives supporting semiconductor are extremely expensive and capital intensive. Right? And without transparency, without uh, uh, free press, these policies can be hijacked and are prone to corruption. Since 2014, and this is all in the Chinese official media, so this is not something that, uh, that, that you have to um, uh, dig out uh, secretly. Since 2014, a Chinese uh, chip fund invested $30 billion in semiconductor uh, production. It has generated a really poor track record without any technological, real technological improvements. One of its portfolio companies, Xinhua Unigroup, was tasked to create China's own semiconductor supply chain. Right? This is actually uh, before Biden administration, um, actually even before Trump. 
And then it went bankrupt in 2021. The CEO was arrested. In fact, what's interesting about this case is that the CEO of the invested company was arrested. The CEO of the investor company was also arrested. So essentially, the Chinese industrial policy, in my own mind, is a lottery. Um, they have some successes, but the ratio of the success to the amount of money spent is fairly low, right? because a lot of money is wasted on these other activities. Relationship with the West has been critical to China's past success in science and technology. Huawei, before 2018, worked with 130 American suppliers in terms of components, in terms of design. And the operating system of Huawei was provided by Google. When I went to Huawei in 2018 and talked to their chief strategist, the chief strategist was a British citizen. So it was incredibly international, right? So you could say Huawei's success is because of Chinese industrial policy, which is a view that many US politicians have. I disagree. Uh, many Chinese students here will probably know Huawei was a private sector company. For many, many years, it was discriminated against by the Chinese government. It only achieved success because of the international collaborations. And now it's the best 5G company in China and probably in the world. Its camera lens was very advanced. Uh, it was a joint development project with a German company, Zeiss. So we have done some statistical work and looking at the Chinese scientific papers. It turns out the most highly cited papers by Chinese scientists are almost always co-authored with Western scientists, right? So Western collaboration is a key. That's a, in my book, I argue Western collaboration is a scope condition that China had. In terms of the policy, let me, uh, Peter, let me draw to the close. Um, how much time do I have? Oh, I don't have any time. No, go ahead, you have a few minutes. Okay. <laughs> So let me end on uh, policy implications for Western governments. So I talk about history, I talk about Communist Party, both before Xi Jinping and during Xi Jinping. Now I end on um, US policy. So this was a speech given by uh, Vice President Joe Biden in 2013, in which he said about the following about China, you cannot think different in a nation, China, where you cannot breathe free. You cannot think different in a nation where you are unable to challenge orthodoxy because change only comes from challenging orthodoxy, right? So this is basically kind of the scope conditions that I was trying to describe, right? So that was in 2013. This is what he said about China in 2021, right? China and other countries are closing in fast. We have to develop and dominate the products and technologies of the future. He kind of forgot what he said in, you know, for a man of his age, I, I guess it's, it's not that um, uh, critical. Um, and, and so he changed his mind, right? Um, I think both of his comments are correct. Except in 2013, he didn't quite understand that China had some scope conditions, such as Hong Kong, such as collaborations with, with the West. So China had some conditions for thinking different. By the way, that think different quote is from Steve, uh, Steve Jobs, right? So Biden was quoting Steve Jobs. So China, so it, it, this is a little bit of a different interpretation from what Sometimes people write about China. They, 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 they think about China as um, autocracy, you know, controlled by a single party. 
party, no freedom and, and no uh, um, uh, autonomy. And by and large, that's correct. But I would argue in high-tech entrepreneurship in science and technology, China before 2018 actually had some of these basic elements in place. This is something that Biden didn't understand in 2013. This is something many Western commentators don't quite understand. And this is something I would argue that current Chinese leaders don't understand, right? Because they have done so much to destroy these uh, scope conditions uh, in the last few years. So for the US, I, I believe that we can learn from China, right? I think for the West, we have had a failure at scale. So if you think about these two conditions, mm -hmm. China has a lot of scale, US has a lot of scope. US and much of the West have systematically underestimated the value of scale, right? China has the opposite problem. They fail to appreciate the importance of the scope. For decades, the US government spending on R&D has remained pretty stagnant. Uh, if you control for inflation, there have been some decrease. As a share of the GDP, it is much smaller as compared with the US spending on R&D in the 1960s. After the Cold War, U.S. has cut its R&D spending dramatically. And also, if you look at the details of the U.S. Uh, R&D expenditures by the government, the U.S. tends uh, uh, spends on two things. One is on computer, computer science, and the other is on biology. Right? And I guess the members of the Congress want to live a long life, so they don't want to cut expenditure on medicine. But as we know, science and technology are not just these two areas, right? There's material science, there's a battery research, there's mechanical engineering. US government has spent very little money on these other things. Whereas China spends a lot of money on all sectors of the technology. This is actually, in fact, why so many Western universities collaborate with Chinese universities, because many Western universities don't have the funding for chemical experiments, physics, and, and other things. They have to source capital from elsewhere. Right? And the US government has not paid attention to the applications of the technology. right? Um, they spend money on inventions, but not a lot of money on applications. But from history, right, we need both, right? We need the government to spend money. We also need the government to be involved in scaling the technology. And I think this is the problem in the West, right? So we bought into this naivete of laissez faire. We believe that if universities come up with right technologies, then the marketplace will automatically absorb these into their production. And, and that's not true. The marketplace doesn't do that. And in fact, if you look at data on how many patents created by the American universities, and how many of these patents are actually commercialized, MIT has one of the highest ratio, probably the highest in the United States, but still even the high ratio is pretty low. There are lots of things that are simply sitting there, not being deployed. The marketplace doesn't recognize the value of these things. And I argue uh, as early as 2018, the right way to compete with China is not trade war, or on the Trump administration, arresting Chinese scientists, right? One of my colleagues was arrested and um, Professor Gong Chen, uh, as a result of that arrest, um, a number of us got together. We created an organization called Asian American Scholar Forum. We have 7,000 Chinese American scientists 
um, in our organization, defending their rights, defending the open science. So the Trump administration started the trade war and they arrested Chinese scientists. But the right thing to do is we should increase our own spending on R&D. And we should think smartly about the role of the government, not just in terms of spending, but also the role of the government to coordinate in order to overcome what is known in the innovation literature as value of the death problem. A lot of inventions are created, but they have a hard time going into the marketplace. China has done a good job. China has done, Chinese government has done a very good job. We have a lot to learn. Recent developments in the US are moving in, in the right direction. For example, there's a CHIPS Act, there's an Inflation Reduction Act, but I would argue that the West, the US and Europe need far more than these um, measures in order to get a scale advantage and to get enough of the scale advantage in order to compete with China. Thank you very much. Well, Yasha, that was uh, terrific. You covered a lot of history, a um, lot of ground. Um, and I want to leave time for questions, but I, I wanted to maybe um, maybe pick up where you ended. Um, uh, um, I on um, kind of the implications in a way for the West and what the United yeah. States and Europe and um, how the West should be responding. Um, you know, because it, it seems to me the way that you've kind of framed this, um, there's this tension between scale and scope, but there's also, it's not just, I mean, today we're not just talking, and this is where you end, a Chinese story, let's just say there's an American story as well. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if there's not an interaction between these, if the, the US invests traditionally more in scope and the Chinese more in scale, what are the implications if the United States goes down, goes invest more heavily in scale, which is what you're encouraging, you're suggesting it should should do. What's the response to that in, in China? It seems to me it does not encourage Chinese investment in scope, yeah. but doubling down on scale, which only has the same effect, a kind of ratcheting effect on the, on the United States. There's a kind of what we call in international relations, a potential like security dilemma here where, where each side in kind of interprets what the other side is doing as, as a real attempt to, um, to bury the other side. Yeah, yeah. Um, Thoughts about that? Yeah, yeah, so uh, is- I think it's all set. Yeah, okay. Um, it is absolutely true that the, um, first of all, I don't think the, scenario you describe is the optimal scenario, ideal scenario. Ideal scenario is that these two countries collaborate right. with each other because they have, they kind of complement with each other in areas where one country is weak and the other country is stronger. And so if you look at sort of the period between 1978 and 2018, you know, the two countries, despite their differences, mm -hmm. were pragmatic about each other. Uh, I think U.S. did lots of things wrong, and China also did lots of things wrong. But at least the two sides were uh, somewhat realistic about their the nature of their relationship mm -hmm. and the conditions under which they could and could not collaborate. Now that consensus has totally collapsed and these two countries are going on their own. It does create this kind of a security dilemma that you described, which is that I benchmark my spending against your spending. Mm -hmm. And the easier way 
to do that is to look at the R&D spending, right? So mm -hmm. the Biden administration has increased its spending. But the thing is, so one nuance of that is that the Biden administration is increasing its spending from a low baseline mm -hmm. position, mm -hmm. whereas the Chinese are increasing their spending already from a very high baseline. I would argue that in this particular situation, US is doing the right thing, China is doing the wrong thing. As I showed in one of my graphs, China is already overspending relative to its per capita GDP, right? So, I mean, you can just, you can make a legitimate argument that there are other things that the country should spend money on. Spend some money on poor children, right? Struggling with healthcare, struggling with uh, basic education. Uh, I, I will make arguments for doing that. And the way that you, can spend a more modest amount on R&D while maintaining technology and science is by collaboration, right? So, but now if you cannot, you do not have the option to collaborate, mm -hmm. then you have to double down on the spending. First of all, it doesn't necessarily guarantee the results. I don't think it would. Uh, I mean, on semiconductor, I just don't think China can recreate the global supply chain of semiconductor, no matter how much money they spend. I just don't think that's, that can happen. A lot of it is going to be wasted. Mm -hmm. right? In a country that has a per capita GDP about $10,000 compared with the US, which has about $40,000. So I would argue that's not really the way to do it. The way to do it is repair the relationship with the West and recreate the kind of a collaborative synergy that the two countries had before, but that would require a political decision. Right. I mean, a cynical view. I mean, if one goes back to that graph that you had, um, the relationship between size and innovation, yeah. um, I think it was that one. No, not size. It was the one where China is just not contemporary. China is getting a lousy return on its investment in, in scale. So I don't know, you didn't have any figures up there about what the U.S. return on, on, on scale yeah. is. But you could argue that, I mean, I, I mean, I think a cynical view is that you force the Chinese on the U.S. side, you try to force the Chinese to invest in scale. Where you want to go, and I get it, it makes sense to me, is to try to get them to invest in scope. Yeah, I, that would be my um, preferred right. uh, scenario. And, but that, you know, that's a that's a political uh, right. decision that they have to make, and I don't see any evidence that the the two countries are right. moving in that direction. Yeah, clearly the United States is not moving in that direction mm -hmm. right now, and 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 it all TikTok, TikTok, yeah, TikTok yeah. right? Um, I, I'm going to open it up. So if we've got um, hands, um, I'm going to start right back there. Yeah, you, yes, you in the gray <clears throat> sweatshirt. Wait one second. Um, I think she's gonna hand you a, a mic. And then there was somebody in the back there. Yes, thank you. I am Kano Grat. I'm a research fellow at the South, uh, LSE Southeast Asian Research. Uh, I have a question that from, from your argument, it seems like the success, the re you haven't mentioned that much about this recent success of the Chinese economic development, which we all have witnessed, more or less, we cannot deny that, that it's become the world, one of the biggest economic power. Of course, you're talking about the scope, but you didn't re link it with the leaderships that I'm wondering, is this be be before the, be before the, before, uh, before the recent, uh, before Xi Jinping, there are earlier president as well. I wonder how the government before uh, him opened the scope besides Hong Kong. Sure. Is that some things before that, that we, we can think, of course, we can think China as an autocratic, but is there something before that as okay, well? Hold, hold that thought. Um, I want to go to the, Woman in the back there, and then we'll go to the internet. 
Um, hi, Professor Huang. Thank you so much for sharing your research, um, especially your database on Chinese inventions is very impressive. Um, so um, my name is Lin. I work as a think tank in London. Uh, so my question is, uh, you talk about the hire of technologists throughout the Chinese history has kind of fueled the Chinese inventions. Um, but there's you know, there's like a really popular theory is that if you look at the recent um, political appointments of Xi's government, there has been a tendency of appointing officials with that technological background in engineering, aviation, and aerospace. Um, so like, what's your understanding of that? Does that add to like the scope that you were talking about? Okay. And uh, we're just very excited to read your new book. Yeah. Thank you. Want to take one more? You sure, I can. One? Maybe I can answer in the reverse order. Um, okay. Do you want me to take another one? Yeah, we can take another one. Go ahead, yeah. Chris. Right, right up here. Just to say, we have more than 100 people on the online platform today. Uh, the first online question comes from uh, Jia Chen Shi, who's a PhD student in political science at Tulane University, who asks, the value of knowledge sharing by Confucianism is sometimes used to justify the massive piracy of forced technological transfer in China. However, Taiwan upholds Confucianism as well, and it has integrated itself to the liberal international economic order way better than China. Do you think the difference can be attributed to these two different attitudes towards nationalism, their economic structures, or some other reasons? Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so, so that question is a little bit um, outside of this uh, discussion the, about piracy. And I, it is true that, um, you know, there has been piracy, intellectual piracy, um, but we shouldn't think that Chinese success is all because of that. Um, and especially in the scientific area, right? So I mean, in the scientific area, there's really nothing to, it's not really characterized by Paris, it's open science, it's publication. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the Chinese uh, accomplishments, um, it has been quite impressive, right? We can debate on the margin, you know, how fully breakthrough the Chinese scientific accomplishments have been, but there's no denying in terms of the quantity of the papers, the quality of the papers, the Chinese scientific production has, uh, has, has generated very, very substantial results. The, the, as I said in my lecture, uh, a large part of that is, is collaboration, mm -hmm. um, working with uh, British scientists, American scientists, uh, Japanese scientists. And so to attribute everything to Heresy, I, I just think that's that's not true. And at the application level, yes, there is, right? So um, companies and um, don't respect the copyrights and trademark. Um, there's, there's violation of the uh, intellectual property rights. But if you look at the data, actually, the rate of piracy in China has declined. Mm. Usually a country becomes more protective of IP when that country becomes a producer of IP rather than simply a consumer of IP. Mm. China is kind of right in the transition from a consumer of IP to the producer of IP. And the companies themselves, Chinese companies themselves have a vested interest in strengthening the IP protection. And that's really the only way for that country to improve its IP record. It is not lectures from us, it's not lectures from Western governments. Mm. So let me get to the question about scientists today being the Politburo members vis-a-vis -vis the scientists uh, previously um, uh, employed by the imperial governments. I can praise the imperial governments for employing so many scientists, and then I can criticize the current government for employing so many scientists using the same logic, right? <laughs> Obviously, when you are sitting members of the Politburo, you're not doing scientific research, right? 
And being a Polyvore member is not really required to satisfy your minimum daily nutritional requirements, which is for a sort of average male about 2,400 calories, right? Whereas in the Asian times, if you don't really have an office job, then you, um, you go to the fields and you, um, you harvest rice. So relieving you from that function and paying you to do some office work, creativity work, that's a massive improvement, right? So I, and also the current Polar Bureau is very interesting. I agree with you, it has quite a few scientists. You know, I guess it's not a bad thing. Uh, by the way, I think US government can use more scientists. <laughs> uh, that, that will be good. Um, when they were uh, asking questions about TikTok, they couldn't even pronounce TikTok correctly. Mm. Uh, they pronounce, uh, pronounce it as a Tic Tac, um, <laughs> which is uh, chewing gum as, a, as far as I understand. Yeah. Yeah. And then they called uh, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, Michael Zuckerberg. So there's just, anyway, lots of, lots of these things. So, I, so I, 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 I don't think it's necessarily wrong to have uh, scientists. But if you look at um, the kind of scientists that are on the Polar Bureau, they tend to be kind of on the military side, uh, aeronautics and, uh, and those rather than civilian technologies. I'm kind of worried um, about the orientation of kind of focusing on military technologies, right? Um, I, I think, you know, I would value drug discoveries. I would value, um, you know, battery technologies, and I wish to see more of those achievements rather than you know so much efforts and attention on missile technologies, precision, precision military uh, technologies, right? So Soviet Union did a lot of that, right? the spillovers from those technologies to the civilian sectors are relatively limited and they are extremely costly and they are uh, goal specific, right? Um, so, so I'm not quite sure how to make of, you, you, you pointed out the right fact. I'm not sure how to make of that fact. Right? On the question about the previous leaders, uh, I, you know, I, I think like a lot of Chinese, I admire Deng Xiaoping. And I think Deng Xiaoping had the right uh, formulation. Um, you know, I criticize him for, for being slow on the political reforms. But he did introduce meaningful political reforms in the early 1980s. He created the term limits. He created the mandatory age retirement. Uh, retirement. Uh, he was very, very careful about not creating a super, super strong uh, party leader. He actually sort of diffused the power among a number of leaders. After Tiananmen, he re-centralized the power. Uh, and, and, I actually believe that was one of the problems that he, he created. He valued the relationship with the West, right? Uh, he himself was a student in France. Uh, he famously said, um, you know, Xi Jinping just returned from Moscow. Deng Xiaoping famously said, if you look at the friends of the United States, they got rich and prosperous. If you look at the friends of Russia, they got poor. <laughs> you know, you know. For me, you know, maybe I'm just shallow and stupid and and, and um, you know, crass. I kind of look at GDP, right? And the West combined has about fifty trillion dollars of GDP. Russia has one point seven. What is one point seven? One point seven is about Guangdong province. So you are forming a strong relationship with a with an economy that has 1.7 trillion dollars, 
And distance, distancing yourself from technology, from $50 trillion of GDP. I don't know, you know, maybe I'm just stupid. I, I don't see the big picture here. <laughs> Uh, and from an economic perspective. Um, so the attraction of Russia is obviously it's autocracy, it is hegemony, uh, but economically, it does nothing good for China. And by the way, I want to point out to the young students in the room, and then I point out this to the Chinese nationalists. If you're a true Chinese nationalist, the country you should hate is Russia. During the 18th century and 19th century, Russia took away 10% of the Chinese territories through a number of uh, treaties, Treaty of Tianjin, Treaty of other, other things. Russian army invaded China, killed many, many civilians. Before the Second World War, they, uh, they invaded uh, Northeast, uh, killed many civilians, raped many Chinese women. They ransacked Chinese factories, right? They gave China a centrally planned economic system that produced terrible results for Chinese people, right? What, what's so good about Russia? I, I just don't see it. My, my, my stupidity is so profound. I don't see it, right? So, so that's a fundamental difference between the previous leaders and the current leadership we are talking about. Take some more questions here. Um, how about this gentleman right here in the center uh, in a blue? And a number of them together we can, yeah. yeah. And then we'll take the woman right next to him. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Um, you've talked about government support for science and technology. Um, how important is a kind of integrated with the science and technology government support for the arts? And related to that, what influence do you think the arts has played in the past with yeah. regards to science and technology? And the woman right next to you. Thank you, Dr. Huang, so much for the presentation. I really look forward to reading the book. Um, I'm curious to know, because this research is done in collaboration with Tsinghua University, how much do you think, um, how much from the book do you think could be communicated to and also absorbed by people that are leading China right now? Okay. Hold on. We're going to take the gentleman right back there. Yeah. He's had his hand up the entire time. <laughs> yeah. Right there. Yeah. In the white jacket. This is in the middle. In the middle. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Professor. I really enjoyed the talk. I just have one question. Did China's um, diminishing scope over the centuries cause its communist tendencies in the 20th century? What was that? I didn't hear the, what's yeah. the last said the last the question again? Did China's diminishing scope over the centuries, as shown by your graph, cause its communist tendencies in the 20th century? Lead towards communist tendencies in the yeah. 20th century. Right. Oh, okay. 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 Yeah. So about arts. Um, um arts may not be directly feeding into science. We actually have data to show that when China was at its peak of its technology, that era was also associated with a very high volume of humanistic creativity, right? So measured by humanistic works per capita, right? And so I, I think these, the creativity is a, a general psychological attribute. You can create arts, you can create science, you can create technology, right? So creativity is the common denominator behind these different domains of human activities. And so if you look at countries that kind of run away with one area, but not with the other, like Soviet Union had that, but it collapsed, right? China, um, I, so, so one thing about China is that um, so sometimes I, I tell my colleagues at, uh, colleagues and friends that U.S. and China have a division of labor. Um, U.S. arrests Chinese scientists in 
China arrests Chinese social scientists. So <laughs> sort of a, uh, um, and over time, there's going to be nobody left. And so the, 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 uh, they, the, for many, many years, Chinese government gave almost like a special space to scientists. They could enjoy more freedom than social scientists, than writers and, and, and others. So you kind of have this um, unbalanced creativity, right? So a lot of, um, lot of uh, development in science and technology. Um, but, you know, Chinese, uh, I, I'm not a uh, specialist on Chinese art, but Chinese uh, social media at one point was very creative and, and maybe it's not high art, uh, but it was very, very creative. So unofficial creativity is still there. I think if China has more freedom, there's no reason why we are not watching Chinese uh, K-pop, right? So uh, CH-pop, right? Um, Netflix or, or, or Amazon. Um, Chinese, are, Chinese are extremely creative. They really, I mean, on the internet and, and, and very, very creative. The, the, the humor and a lot of that is forbidden. It is, it is really a pity, actually. It's really a pity that that part of Chinese creativity doesn't come out as well because of the political system. Right? Um, on the Tsinghua University collaboration. So uh, we are writing a separate book just on history and using that database. This book only has one chapter and it kind of scratches the surface. Our book in collaboration with Chinese academics and, and other American academics is going to really look at history is totality rather than alternating between history and today. So this book doesn't really travel to China. I don't think it will see the Chinese translation uh, because, of, because of its points of views. Um, and, um, but, but we, uh, we just got a contract from Princeton University Press. We have finished about three chapters out of uh, six chapters. Um, and we have more data, we have more stories, we have more narratives. I hope what I said today, and I hope what I expressed in my book is that I'm not an ideologue. I'm basing myself on facts and data. The facts and data are saying that in order for technology to develop, we need both scale and scope. And I'm not radical either. I'm not saying that, oh, you need to overthrow the government or something like that. China got it right. I mean, as I answered to the, uh, my answer to the previous question under Deng Xiaoping. And they got it right in terms of de delivering economic growth, in terms of delivering a scientific progress and technology. I, frankly speaking, I think if they have no more freedom, they could go even further, but you know, still they got it right. They also remarkably re maintained political stability during the period when the economy was growing at 8%, 9% a year. That's not easy to have, right? So, you know, so my, I, I consider myself as a moderate based not on kind of Western values and Western ideology, it, it, it is based on, on data, on facts. Of course, uh, uh, on facts, uh, you know, in any scholarly endeavor, you, you can have different points of views, you can have different interpretations of data. I feel more comfortable having that debate rather than debating with Chinese nationalists who say, oh, you betray your country uh, and, and things like that, right? So I have been called that, right? So. It is very strange for people to view me that way because I care about China. I want China to grow strong, to be prosperous. And that's why I try to figure out what has made China prosper in the past. And let's see if we can have recreate the similar conditions, right? 
Yeah, on the, on the last question, there's a... Okay, yeah. go ahead. We've, we're basically run out of time. We've yeah. hit the bewitching hour. So just a quick response. There. Yeah, so so it's a very interesting question, the um, uh, the adoption of communism in the 20th century. So when China opened, there were a number of ideologies available for adoption, right? And so if you compare how China opened to the... West and how Japan opened to the West. I think in the end, these two countries opened to the West by selecting the, the Western ideology that is, that is more um, similar to their own history mm. and tradition, right? So uh, let's remember, uh, communism is a 100% Western ideology. Let's just make it very, very clear. Created by Marx and Engels and then introduced to uh, China by Russian Revolution. And by the way, many of the first works on communism were translated from Japanese to Japan, right? But China chose communism because I think, although I'm not an expert on this, because I think communism reminds them of some strong ideas of Confucianism, whereas Japan selected a form of Western ideology that is basically German, right? More militaristic uh, dictatorship. That is kind of a similar to their own tradition, right? So in the end, uh, countries selected Western ideas based on their own traditions rather than importing something that is totally contradictory to their own culture and tradition. So the answer to your question, yes, this diminishing scope means that Confucianism was the one ideology China had, and then they selected communism because communism is also kind of similar in that regard. And, and, then, um, and then, you know, the leaders uh, chose that ideology because of it. So I know we have many other questions, but we, we really have run out of time. So my, my apologies there. Yashang, this has been terrific. Uh, it's been great to have you here. I think all of us, you know, I look forward to your book. I hope you solve the paper supply problem. Um, and uh, please join me in welcoming. Yeah. And thank you. Thank you.